Welcome to another teaching on Father-Son Theology. I'm Harold Eberly. I wrote a book entitled Father-Son Theology. It's a systematic theology, so it begins by developing understanding of the nature of God and then applies all those areas to the different topics that are normally addressed in theology. Uh, in this session, we're taking from the book, Volume 7, which addresses ecclesiology and basiology, which is the study of the church and the study of the kingdom. And even this, I'm going to break up into two sessions right now. This session is about the study of the church, ecclesiology. I'd like to talk about that. Again, I have my whiteboard as I have in other sessions. However, in this, I've used this whiteboard to put below the timeline development of Western Christianity and above the timeline uh, what Christianity would be like if we were not reading the Bible through our Western worldview. And I have been emphasizing how profoundly Western Christianity has been influenced by Plato and the Greek, ancient Greek philosophers. Well, in the subject of ecclesiology, study of the church, I don't believe it is quite as profoundly influencing as in the other areas of theology that we've been developing. So I'm not gonna be using this diagram as much as I have in the past, but I'd like to refer to it from time to time. Okay, ecclesiology. I'd like to first distinguish between the church and the kingdom. What is the church and what is the kingdom? And there's a scripture that helps me make the distinction. Um, and it's important because throughout church history, 2,000 years, various Christian groups have confused the two. Um, what is the church and what is the kingdom? Right quickly, I would try to emphasize that 2,000 years ago, Jesus died rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sat down on a throne. That throne it represents him ruling over the kingdom. That kingdom was established 2,000 years ago. All authority was given to Jesus by the Father, and now Jesus reigns. He's been reigning for 2,000 years. Everything under his reign is his kingdom. Everything um, that he has won the hearts of. So first of all, we can identify the kingdom as his reign over the hearts of humanity. But the kingdom is that which flows through their hearts, flowing from Jesus through the hearts, bringing righteousness, peace, and joy. It's the reign of Jesus Christ. So I'm saying the kingdom of God is the reign of Jesus Christ. In contrast, the church is the community. It's a community of God's people here on earth. Well, one of the things that helps make this distinction is if we go back to the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles chapter 17, because this was a promise made to King David. You may remember the time when King David said, I want to build a house for God. And Nathan the prophet came to him and spoke the word of the Lord to him and said, no, David, you're not going to build for me a house, but one of your descendants will. Well, that explanation helps us understand what actually gets fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, 1 Chronicles 17, verse 11 this is Naaman speaking to David, when your days will be fulfilled, that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up one of your descendants after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. So, right there, the God has spoken through the prophet to David, saying, no, David, you're not going to build for me a house, but one of your descendants will. And your descendant will do two things. He'll build for him a house, and he'll establish a kingdom. The kingdom will be an eternal kingdom, a forever kingdom. Now, we know the immediate descendant of David was Solomon. And Solomon built a kingdom and a, built a house, the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. And he ruled over a kingdom. Now, uh, unfortunately, maybe fortunately, but the fact is that kingdom did not endure forever. Solomon's kingdom did not endure forever. So we know Solomon did not fulfill this promise. Um, so we look for another descendant of David, who is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, born of God and born of man, born of the lineage of David, and yet we know it was the Spirit of God coming to the womb of Mary, taking on flesh. So we have another descendant of David. Jesus comes on the scene and says, I will build a house. The gates of Hades will not prevail. That's the fulfillment of this promise that was made to David. Jesus is building a house. Um, also, he says the kingdom of God is at hand. So now there's a kingdom that's been established through Jesus Christ. We have the two elements. It help, helps us to see in Jesus how these are fulfilled by looking at the original promise that was made to King David. The house 
is the temple in which God would dwell. And Solomon built that in a natural sense, fulfilled it in a natural sense, where Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. But the kingdom that Solomon ruled over was much bigger than the house. The house is a smaller entity within the kingdom over which Solomon reigned. So also in the New Testament, the house is a smaller entity within the kingdom over which Jesus reigns. The house is made of living stones, people. People here on earth who love God, they become a temple for the Holy Spirit. Corporately, all of us together make up this community referred to as the church. The church is that entity on earth made up of all who believe in Jesus, who become temples of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is the reign of Jesus who now sits at the right hand of the throne of God and reigns over all. The church is within the kingdom, but it's not the kingdom. The kingdom is much bigger. Um, as as Christians, we are both members of the church and citizens within the kingdom. As members of the church, we see ourselves in a community. That community is where we are to meet with God and have fellowship, have community. I would put those as priorities in understanding what the church is all about. Now, I want to come back up here to this timeline. I have the year zero here, the year 2000 here, just to refer to some of the confusion that's gone on in Christianity. Jesus and the disciples, when they were walking the streets, proclaimed the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is available. The king had arrived. But they were also talking about building the church, building uh, the community, that it would grow and become a temple in which the Spirit of God would dwell. We should then expect from the day Jesus establishes the community, the church, which is growing, that it should continue to grow, becoming a dwelling place for God, that we should continue to see and believe for the church to be fitly framed together. Um, Jesus prayed the prayer for his people, Lord, make them one. We should expect then this community to have a oneness about it. And we would pray that that oneness would increase over time. Yet, when we look at church history, there were some specific turning points, especially like Augustine in his writing, The City of God. Um, the time was when the Roman Empire uh, was crumbling, but the city of Rome in 410 was actually destroyed. The city of Rome was conquered. Well, that began the crumbling of the empire, but on 410 when the city was destroyed, so many Christians were looking to Rome as the headquarters of Christianity. Now, right or wrong, that's just what happened in history. The church was really divided into the east and the west. The western part of Christianity centered in Rome. Uh, that develops into the Roman Catholic Church, where the Orthodox Church, the eastern part of the church, gets more and more centered in Constantinople. There's a division that's forming. Uh, not stated, it just is happening. And there are two different languages are emphasized. There's distance back then. It's hard to keep everything together. And the Orthodox Church takes over more and more of the Eastern part. And the Catholic begins to rise up. Even today, Catholicism is the largest denomination in the world. Orthodoxy is the second largest. Catholics, there's about a billion Catholics in the earth, about 800 million Orthodoxies. Okay, well... Emphasizing now the Western Church, Roman Catholicism. Um, the, when Augustine wrote his book, The City of God, he was somehow dealing with the loss of faith where so many Christians in that part of the world were looking to Rome for leadership. Here, the leadership in Rome is destroyed. Things are crushing the city of Rome. The government gets disbanded at that point. Well, the government is getting, you know, scattered, many of them killed, but the church, still centered in Rome, had the only coherent leadership group in 410 that had any kind of cohesiveness, any kind of authority. The natural government gets destroyed in Rome, but the church leadership is still there. So at that time, the church leadership, being the only cohesive group, it rose in authority. It had a much greater stance. And so people... They see that, and Augustine writes a book called The City of God, where he says, God never really intended that the government in Rome be the headquarters of the kingdom, but that the church in Rome should be. He allowed 
Christianity, historic Christianity, to shift its allegiance to the government in Rome and shift to the church leadership in Rome. Then what followed was the terminology kingdom and church became equated. And that continued from about the year 500 to 1500, about a thousand years. When you read church history, the word kingdom is often equated with church in the Middle Ages. The Roman Catholic Church says she is the kingdom. We are the headquarters of the kingdom of God. We are the church. They equated those words. Now, I started off this teaching trying to distinguish between the church and the kingdom. Headquarters of the kingdom is up in heaven where Jesus sits on his throne. Um, the church, yes, it's an entity of living stones here. But as soon as the mistake was made to equate the church and the kingdom, the church took on a different nature. Because how you identify yourself determines how you act. Um, when the church began to identify as of the kingdom of God, she could justify becoming more radical, uh, more violent. Because when she sees herself as a kingdom, the violent take it by force. The kingdom has the authority to establish its reign, to go and conquer areas. It was with that frame of mind, the church being the kingdom, that she could uh, think and rationalize the Crusades when the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church organizes and sends people down to try to take back first Jerusalem and then conquer other areas that the Islam, Muslims had conquered. So she could justify the crusade. She could also justify killing heretics because a kingdom is a much more aggressive thing. So long as she had defined herself as a community, um, it would be difficult to even think that that's what you're supposed to do. So this equ equality, this this creating the church and thinking of her as the kingdom begins to dominate throughout the Middle Ages until Martin Luther. Martin Luther looks at that entity in Rome and says that is not the kingdom of God. Okay, now there were a lot of other Christians who were protesting, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of them had protested throughout the years. But Martin Luther is the known as the birth of the Protestant Reformation, 1517, he takes a stand. Well, he and others were looking at Rome and saw the sinfulness, saw the abuse, and they pointed that thing, that's not the kingdom of God. Well, this really becomes a separation in Martin Luther and many Protestants' thoughts about what is the kingdom, what is the church. Martin Luther actually began to think of the natural government on earth as the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God was supposed to work through the natural government, while the church was a separate entity. In particular, Martin Luther... Uh, looked at the government in in Germany where he was based okay he was in Switzerland for a time but in Germany that government was very influential and he would often look to that and say the government of Germany is the kingdom of God where the church is a separate entity now again he would made it general that all governments in earth could serve as kingdom instruments but yet he made a separation then between the church and the kingdom German government being emphasized as the strongest kingdom influence on earth. Now that had influence. I'm trying to show that thoughts have consequences. How we understand the kingdom determines actions. Well, the state religion of Germany became Lutheranism. Luther's theology dominated um, all the way up to the present time. It wasn't until the generation before us when Germany was kind of starting to let go of the state religion of Lutheranism. Even today, the state uh, finances the Lutheran Church in Germany. So it still is a state religion, but in history, before this last generation, Lutheranism was very strong in Germany. That played a significant role um, in World War II. One of the reasons that the church in, in Germany did not speak against the government, what was going on when Hitler started killing so many people. One of the reasons was her theology was that the kingdom works through the government and the church is a separate entity. Because of Lutheran's, the Luther's theology was still established in Germany, the Christians in that country still had the theology that the government's a separate entity than the church. Therefore, the church has no authority to speak against the kingdom of God. That silenced the church. Now, not all Christians were silent, but Luther's theology played a major role in silencing the church, making her feel that she cannot speak against the kingdom of God, which, which was, in their minds, the government of Germany. Thoughts have consequences, just like throughout the Middle Ages. 
When the church thought she was the kingdom, she became more violent and aggressive. Okay, so it is important. Now, there's been a lot of other views of the kingdom. Different people thought they're establishing the kingdom of God in certain areas. Many of the Puritans who came from England into the United States, but is the New England area of the colonies, they thought they were establishing the kingdom of God in, in that area, in Maine, Connecticut, Massachusetts, all that area. They said, we'll establish the kingdom of God there. Okay, so we, we've got to, instead of... Uh, designing our theology after what we want to do, we have to look back in the scriptures and say, okay, God, what did you originally tend? What is it? We want to be true to your plan for the church and the kingdom. Yes, the kingdom has much more of an advancing, aggressive nature, but the church. See, the church above all is a community. And we can reinforce that, develop it by looking at the metaphors that are used for the church. Uh, I've written down a few here. Of course, the, the church is referred to as the people of God, the elect, the saints, and the holy ones, the called ones. In fact, the word church means the called out ones. Uh, believers, brethren, flock. This concept of a flock, sheep, is much in the New Testament. The body of Christ, the extension of Christ, which each Christian being a different member in the body. The temple of the Holy Spirit, the bride of Christ. See, these metaphors... Um, that are used for the church in the New Testament are not the metaphors of warfare. They're the metaphors of following, enjoying God's presence, being under the leadership of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a little different flavor, the metaphors that are used, than what we would expect with a kingdom. The church is above all to be a community, a flock, people who love one another. We'll be known by our love. It's a community where the kingdom is a reigning entity. This separation is really important um, for when we look in the Bible and try to get founded in what the Bible teaches, we are less likely to make mistakes in the future. Yes, the kingdom is real, the church is real, but the kingdom is the rulership of Jesus. Every Christian is a, both a member of the church and a citizen of the kingdom. But when we go outside the walls of the community, we still are in the kingdom of God. We as believers have citizen rights. We should be establishing the will of Jesus in every area of society. Now we'll talk more about that when we talk about the kingdom of God in the next part. But, um, and it's a different session, next part. But right here, coming back to the church. Church is a community. I want to be careful of this because the word church in the Greek, it's ekklesia. That's what the word that's usually translated as church in the New Testament, ekklesia. Literally, it means called out ones. And that's appropriate, the ones God has called out. It also fits with the Old Testament thoughts when God would say, you are my people and I am your God. You are the people I've called out from the world and I've taken to myself. Okay, that's the imagery of the church, the called out ones, the ones God gathered to himself. But in the New Testament, not only has he gathered us, but he's put his spirit within us. He's brought us under a new covenant in which our sins are forgiven, in which his spirit is one with us, these called out ones. Um, looking more at that word ecclesia, some Christians today are trying to emphasize different aspects of ecclesia. See, the word in Greek was used about 300 years before Jesus in the Greek empire. Um, sometimes citizens would gather together and they would make governing decisions. They would come together when there's a problem in their city, their community, and an ecclesia would come together. A gathering would come together to make decisions. And it was governmental decisions. That was about 300 years before Jesus. Well, sometimes Christians today look at that and then they try to say, well, the ecclesia, the church today, is supposed to be doing what was done in the ancient Greek Empire to make governmental decisions. And I just want to put a caution on that, okay? It's true that the word ecclesia was used in the Greek Empire, but that was 300 years earlier, and um, we don't see it used that way in the New Testament. In fact, the word ecclesia is used um, just to refer to any group of called out people, not governing bodies, any group. In fact, in Acts, let me just refer to these scriptures, Acts 19, verse 32, 39, and 41. The word ecclesia there is used to a mob. That's used for a mob, the ones that came out to try to quiet Paul and his brethren as they were preaching, a mob. You know, So 
to just try to use the word ecclesia and assign it to how it was used 300 years earlier in a different empire, it's shaky grounds. I think we're much more uh, being consistent with Scripture if we realize that the word ecclesia in the Old Testament times was more associated with the synagogue of the Jewish people. Sometimes they were called the ecclesia. If we're going to look for consistency in the Scripture, how was it used when the Old Testament was translated into the Greek and Septuagint? The word ecclesia often refers to just the gathering of the Jewish people. The gathering, the congregation. The congregation was the ecclesia. Okay? Yes, we could find how the word was used to refer to a mob of people here or a governmental entity in, in um, Greece at another time. And, and we might learn from those. We might take some things from those. But the primary place we need to look is how is the word used throughout Scripture? What is the main theme? And the main theme, the metaphors that are used, how this church is to be, is a community, a flock, the body of Christ. This is the flavor that we get. And that's different than a ruling entity. Um, okay, If we were to define ourselves as a ruling entity, we would immediately take that on. And yes, there's things we can do, but I believe that much more of the ruling attributes of Christianity should be manifested through the kingdom of God, which we're talking about in the next session, rather than through the church. The church is a community. The kingdom of God is the reign of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's the frame of reference from where I come. Okay, now let me come back here. Uh, one of the issues that's worth discussing is when did the church start? And... How people answer that sometimes depends on the rest of their theology. Some people will say, well, it started at the death of Jesus, some at Pentecost Day. Um, some would say when Jesus said to Peter, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Okay, Roman Catholics normally will use that scripture because they like to think the church was built on Peter and then they try to find a, a succession of other leaders like Peter who were the number one leader in their mind, and they say those are the popes, Peter being the first pope. Okay, that's just one way that uh, part of the body of Christ looks at the start of the church. Others will say, no, the church actually started way back with Abraham, that God had a called out people, all of Abraham's descendants, and the New Testament are just the called out people in Jesus, but it's still the people God's called to himself. Now, that's one way to look at it. Yes, God's always had a called out people, a people unto himself. However, I have a difficult time using the word church to refer to the Old Testament called out people because of scriptures like in Ephesians 2.20 where it says the church, the ecclesia, is being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The foundation are what the apostles that walked with Jesus are building. So I can't... You know, I can see validity in the different times people would say the church started, Pentecost Day, death of Jesus, resurrection of Jesus, you know, Jesus spoke to Peter. There's some validity to all those, but yet it's still the word church I'm using it to refer to the sense Jesus has created a people and they're building on the apostles and, and prophets that that's who is being referred to when we speak to the church, okay? Now, because it's being built on the apostles and prophets, the apostles particularly, today we have to pay special attention to their writings. The New Testament is especially valid because if we want to keep building the church on the foundation of the apostles, we must be faithful to what they wrote. This Bible is what we have of their writings. So that's one of the reasons that the Bible is so important to us. Okay, of course, we believe it's inspired by God. That even gives a greater validity. But just the fact that we're supposed to build the church on the teachings of the apostles. Now, um, talking about more of the government of the church. Okay, let's talk about that. The word government to me is too heavy-handed to use to even refer to the church. Uh, think about this. Even though in saying that, I'm challenging a lot of Christian traditions. You read books on church government. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of books on church government. Well, before I even get into church government, I would like to challenge the word government. I'm not so sure that that's the right word. I'm not so sure that a church should have government. Okay, Government is a little heavy-handed of a word to talk about a flock. I mean, you have a shepherd of a flock, um, the body of Christ. Yes, we have a head Jesus, and we have under-shepherds. 
Um, but to use certain terminology like government, to, to enter this dialogue by saying, what is the government of the church? I believe is to enter wrongly. Um, imagine a uh, general in the army. There's a government in the army. It is a strict order, okay? But if that general went to his home where his wife and children are, um, he can't run his family the same way he runs the army. Um, if he did, his family would not be a family. It would turn into an institution. It would turn into something else if he tried to establish a similar government. Now, yes, he could be the head in his family. With his wife, you know, there is a certain authority. Yes, we recognize that. But the word government, um, it's not applied in the Bible to the church. And so today, if we just imply, start off our discussion saying, what's the government of the church? I think we've already gotten off on the wrong foot. You know, part of the thing that confuses this issue is the King James Version of the Bible. The King James Version, authorized in 1610, okay, it was designed for a specific purpose. King James wanted a version of the Bible um, because he had taken the Church of England and separated from Roman Catholicism. At that time in history, John Calvin's Bible, called the Geneva Bible, was the most common Bible um, throughout Europe. And it was all over in England, King James's country. John Calvin's Bible, the Geneva Bible, has marginal notes, and you can still go back and see it, that justified rebellion to the king. That John Calvin was not a fan of kings, okay? He put it marginal notes. Well, King James did not want everybody in his kingdom using John Calvin's Bible. That's when the decision was made, we need a Bible um, that's to replace John Calvin's Bible. And King James gave 15 uh, directives to the translators. You can still find these, Google them, go online, King James directives for interpreting, uh, for translating the King James Bible, okay? Well, one of those directives that they were told to do is use old ecclesiastical words such as okay like the word bishop so when ephesians and some of the philippians some of the letters of paul they start off and to the church and to the bishops and deacons the bishops and deacons okay well the king james is translated and used the word bishop but in reality there were no bishops when paul wrote philippians and colossians and Galatians. Yet the King James puts in the word bishops. Why? Because King James had ordered the translators to use words that would grant more authority to the Church of England, which he established and separated from Roman Catholicism. Had they not used those words, their heads would have been cut off. Okay. And so what I'm doing here is I'm trying to say, we really need to look at this issue of what is the government of the church? Okay. The word government's a little bit heavy handed to me. I'm not so sure that we should talk in those terms. And in order to get away from it, we've got to be careful when we use the King James because the King James promotes more authority, more uh, heavy-handedness than the actual original words that were written by the apostles. For example, uh, Hebrews 13, 7. King James says, honor those who rule over you, where literally, modern translations, not the King James, and the original Greek says, honor those who lead you or led you. Okay, ruling over is more heavy-handed than those who led you. And I would propose to you that the terminology that the original Greek, that the apostles coined, the point words they used to describe the leadership of the church was not heavy-handed. It was not governmental. Um, no, it was community-oriented. There's a leading, there's a shepherding, there's a guiding. And Paul at times did use authority over the congregation. He corrected them boldly. Um, so I'm not trying to dismiss that. I'm, yeah, there is a fathering element in the church. Um, there is caring, but we have to think in those terms. Okay, um, in the early church in Acts, we see elders. In fact, in Acts fourteen twenty three, uh, Paul and his partners went from city to city, appointing elders in every city. Okay, this was the common practice: elders over every community, and this was a group at that time. Um, there were also deacons um, that we see in the one church in Jerusalem where they raised up some deacons, but the word deacon means servant. They were called simply to serve the natural uh, needs, you know, food, 
housing, facility, whatever it is, help the people in the natural ways. Where the elders, they did have authority to oversee the flock. Terminology is used in the Bible to say, honor the elders who oversee, who shepherd, okay? That element. Still trying to be careful with our words to stay in tune with the flavor, the tenor of Scripture. Um, now, it wasn't until the second century, after about a hundred years, that the word bishop actually starts coming. The first apostles died. Okay, they only lived so long. Um, by the year 100, we think they were all dead. We don't know exactly when John died, but we think right around then. Um, but And then during the next hundred years, the word bishop rises up. Bishop being someone promoted above the elders. Bishop, sometimes having just one church, sometimes having several churches that they oversee. So in the 200s and 300s, more and more bishops are coming. And they did, in a sense, replace the apostles. Um, but it became a little bit more structured. And part of this structuring, we need to realize in the season, in the culture in which it's in, um, Jesus, born into a Jewish region of the world, Israel, that's where he ministered, but during the first hundred years, early Christian communities that were coming out of Israel because of evangelism and because they were being heavily persecuted, they're coming into the Roman world. It's the Greco-Roman world, Greek culture and Roman government. Well, if we want to understand the Greek culture, I have explained often in these sessions that the very foundation of Greek culture is the separation of the spiritual from the natural. But if we want to understand Roman culture, we normally... Um, historians, people who understand it, will say, want to understand Greek culture? Order. Get everything ordered. So, Christianity now is coming into the Roman Empire. People naturally think we should organize things. We should get it straight. That's just the culture. All roads lead to Rome. All things need to be orderly. That's how they thought. So, it was just natural for as the church is coming into Romans, Romans are now embracing it. In fact, the vast majority, by, by the year uh, in 200, vast majority of Christians were Romans who had embraced Christianity. No longer Jews who embraced them. They're still Jews, but the vast majority are now Romans. They want to get this thing organized. So it was just natural to start thinking more um, bishop, having a little bit more structure, things becoming more structured as we go on. In the year 325, there was a, even a huge, big step in this structure. And uh, 325 was the year that Constantine, the emperor of Rome, called all the bishops in the world together. He asked for all of them to come together, and they were to do several things. In Constantine's heart, he wanted a creed to be developed, a statement of faith, by which the entire empire could be united, because the Roman Empire was now becoming Christian. Millions and millions. Ever since the year 313, that's when Christianity was made legal in the Roman Empire, Within 75 years of that date, 75% of the Roman Empire was considered Christian. Now, they may not have been Christian the way we today understand Christianity, and yet they were, uh, they were associating with Christianity. Um, they were hearing about Jesus Christ, a huge transition. But in the year 325, this, this massive change is happening in the Roman Empire where people are becoming Christian. So now the emperor gets all the bishops. Now, all of them didn't come, but he asked them all to come together. And they come up with the Nicene Creed, which developed into the Apostles' Creed. A statement of faith, a creed, saying what is Christianity all about? What are the fundamentals that everyone must believe? You know, I believe one God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, is still spoken today in many churches around the world. Okay? First, the Nicene Creed. It changed a couple times with just a few phrases in time. But it's developed right here. Well, that changed the uh, leadership of the church becoming more governmental, becoming more ordered, because once all these bishops came together, under the uh, invitation of the emperor, now they are recognized by the Roman government. Christian leadership is recognized by the Roman government. That gives them more authority. That elevates them up in the eyes of communities all over the Roman Empire, within their own church communities, everywhere now. These are the bishops who were sent to Rome. And they actually went to the city of Nicaea. There, these are the bishops who went there. Um, something else changed. The Pope, okay, I'm using that word cautiously, little parentheses, okay, he was the bishop in Rome. 
he was still considered just a bishop by most of the other bishops, the bishop in Rome. The bishop in Rome did not go to that uh, meeting. He sent two um, representatives, but the bishop in Rome didn't go. However, historians today look at that as differently. Roman Catholic historians will normally say the bishop in Rome actually gave his stamp of approval on this creed. And his stamp of approval identifies that the bishop in Rome is higher than all the other bishops. He, and that's where the Roman Catholics start using the word. He was the Pope. Where all of the other bishops who were not associated with Rome, they thought they were all equal. And this is normally where Protestants say there's a division where Roman Catholics, Roman Catholicism, was separating itself from the West of, West, West of Christianity, rest of Christianity. Catholics disagree and say, no, there's always been a Pope from Peter, linkage, 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 all the way up. That bishop in Rome was always the Pope and has been for 2,000 years. So there's a discrepancy, confusion, argument about what actually happens here. Uh, Catholics says there's always been a Pope and the bishop in Rome was that Pope. Protestants will normally say, no, 325, all the bishops got together, they were coming together on an equal basis, but that bishop in Rome starting to claim that he is above everybody else from that point on. Um, so the bishop in Rome, however, being Roman, it's getting more and more organized. It's going to get ordered. We're going to now get a full hierarchy in the Roman Catholic Church, from cardinals all the way down. There's all levels from the bishop on down to the priest in the communities. That develops, a liturgy develops. Every church should be doing the same thing. In Rome, that's just how you want to get things organized. The buildings become organized, straight rows of the chairs. Everything is getting structured because when you bring Christianity into an ordered society, it's going to influence things. We are a product today of what happened back then. Now that doesn't mean we should get rid of it all, um, but it does give us, um, directives, it gives us permission to re-look at it and say, well, that didn't come from the Bible. There's nowhere in the Bible that says to order your church meetings in straight rows. There's nowhere in the Bible that talks about cardinals or bishops. Those words have been added, okay? Not to throw them out, but to say, um, what is useful? It doesn't contradict the Bible. What is useful for us? And I would just add this one part. I believe that originally the church was much more family-oriented, much more community-oriented, much more discipleship of one to other. And when I look at it, it says, um, we lost some of that the more the church got ordered. And as it gets ordered, it takes on an institutional flavor rather than a family flavor. So when I'm looking at this, what is it that we should discard? Yes, church came into order. Don't want to get rid of all the order. We need order. Church is huge now, worldwide. We can't get things done without more order than happened um, in the first 50 years of the church. We do need more order. But it's not that it's um, st structured in the Bible and told us this is how you should order. Therefore, we have freedom to change it according to how it should be. But when we look at here, there was an element of community versus institutionalism that if we really want the community as she should be, we're going to have to work to develop that. The church, community, kingdom, the reign of Jesus Christ. Okay, come back here. Today, okay, watching church government developed, there's different streams, especially now in Protestant, 1500, out of Roman Catholicism, there's four major branches, streams of Protestant thought, the Anabaptists, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, and Calvinism, Reformed theology, those major four streams. Well, today when historians, church buffs look at uh, church government, they usually put it in three categories. Episcopal, Presbyterian, or Congregational. You ask them, what's the church government of a local church? And even today, um, people trained in theology or in church will say, well, they have an Episcopal form of government, or they have a Presbyterian form of government or they have a congregational form. These are the main three. Episcopal meaning one person at the top. Presbyterian means there's a board of elders. Elders rule, and these elders have equal authority at the top. Or congregational, where the whole congregation votes. Those are the three main. Now there's all kinds of diversions, little you know, variations on this, but 
books on church government, many of them, as I said, hundreds of them. Um, first of all, I don't like the word government. I think it's too heavy-handed. We shouldn't even have it. But then they categorize into one of those three. People like me come from the position of the church should have shepherds who are in the fivefold ministry. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says God has appointed first apostles, second prophets. Then he goes on, teachers, administrators, helps miracles, okay? He gives an order. We can look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. The gifts of Jesus Christ. He gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Fivefold ministry. Um, to me, uh, if we were going to structure the church as it was, Jesus ordered it. First apostles, second prophets. We would have the order that is stated in 1 Corinthians 12, and that which is taught us in Ephesians chapter 4, and those orders cannot be categorized in Episcopal, Presbyterian, or Congregational. It, they don't quite fit. Therefore, all those books that try to fit us into one of those categories, I think we need to set them aside and rethink this thing, and I believe that's going on right now all over the world. Churches, who are not too locked into one denominational structure, are reconsidering what is an apostle. And we would come to say an apostle, the word means a sent one, sent by God, and they father the work. They can not only father one work, they might father many works. There's an apostle, apostolic anointing. They father a work, a prophet. They have an authority with their words. They speak into something, and they give a direction. But we have the fivefold ministry, pastors, where there's not just one pastor, but there are many pastors, even within a congregation. Now, we're not going to teach the whole fivefold ministry structure right now. There are many books written about that, including my own book, The Complete Wineskin, but there are many other authors who've written on it. But the point is, we're studying the church right now. One of the important points is, how is it governed? It should be shepherded. People have certain gifts. Yes, there's authority, but it's a community. Okay, let's move on to a couple other things that are important. Um, the work of the church, what she's supposed to be doing, well, she, can minister, she needs to lead, help the people meet with God, first of all. It is a community. Remember in the Old Testament when David said, I want to build you a house. And God says, one of your descendants will build me a house and establish a kingdom. The, the house that God referred to, built first by Solomon, but totally feel fulfilled in Jesus, that temple, the purpose is a place to meet with God. We should identify the house that God's building. Number one, it's a place to meet with God. We are going to help people come into the presence of God. Number two, it's a community. What is the church? It's a place to meet with God, people who reconcile to God, and it's a community. Now, there are a lot of other purposes for the church, to train, to equip, to evangelize, to do all those things. But in my looking, what is emphasized in the New Testament, I have come to dissolve, and every leader has to come to their own convictions, that number one, if I'm a leader of a church, I want to provide for them a place where they encounter God and a place where they can have community. Um, so having that as my thing, I also then would add on, yes, we're going to equip, train, but also the church is to evangelize. The go out, fulfill the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. But to me, those are the step down. Um, now, the meetings. What kind of meetings should we have in the church? Still discussing. What is this ecclesia? Uh, in the New Testament, we see small group meetings and big meetings. There are huge gatherings, like on Pentecost Day, huge gathering, but then they also met house to house. If we're going to carry on that pattern, um, we should have big, large meetings, and we should have small meetings. Community is necessary. You have to have small meetings for true community. But you also, there's something about the corporate gathering where people come together and worship God together where the presence of God does manifest. Now, many churches have no concept of the presence of God manifesting in the terminology I'm saying. But because it is an emphasis in what I see the purpose of the church, there is a tangible presence that ought to be manifesting among God's people as Moses cried out when he went up on the mountain and said, God, unless your presence is with us, I don't want to leave here. I don't want to go. That the church, unless God's presence is with us, why should we even go on? We must make it a priority. Why should we even have church if God's presence doesn't come? And it is, the presence of God, it is influenced by the hearts of the people. When people are in strife and confusion and hate each other, the presence of God does not manifest normally. 
But when there is a loving community, they orient their hearts toward Jesus. Jesus said, I will be there when my people gather in my name. And that's what he was referring to. Whenever my people come into unity, I will be there. That's God wants us to become a corporate temple in which he can dwell. Not only individually does he dwell in us, but in a large gathering, but also in smaller gatherings. So we look for both. Um, now, the does the... I don't know what to call it, maybe the tenor, the goal of these meetings, what should we be accomplishing in there? Um, much of that, to answer that question, is determined by our theology. Now here I would come back to the primary teaching throughout Father-Son Theology that I've been doing in these series. I was teaching up here Father-Son Theology and then Western Christianity down here. And when we developed Western Christianity, one of the major things of the theology is it's centered on solving man's problem of sin, guilt, and God's wrath. I mean, here, Western Christianity is focused on that. Here is man's problem. Sin, guilt, God's wrath, judgment coming. Okay. Therefore, in fitting with that theology, the church is supposed to be offering an answer. So if this is your theology, the church will be offering that answer and trying to lead people to the answer. So guilt, sin, God's wrath, the answer being the death of Jesus in that theology. So church meetings will have a strong emphasis, if that's your theology, on helping people realize they're sinners, helping them realize they're going to be judged, God's wrath, and then giving the answer, which is lead them to the cross of Jesus Christ, to remember what was done on the cross. The whole atmosphere of that is an awareness of my sin, but awareness of how good God is to send Jesus to die on the cross. Therefore, someone would leave a church with that theology, um, most likely walking out the doors, conscious that they're sinners, but thanking God for sending Jesus. Okay, that's what it would be. In contrast, I was talking in this series about the theology of father-son theology, that seeing God as a father and ourselves as children of God, and that what God did through Jesus is not just on the cross, but in the resurrection, he conquered death. In the ascension, everything was put under the feet of Jesus. He's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Now he is king and Lord. Um, it, that changes everything. If your theology is more as I have been teaching in this series, then the church's responsibility to present that truth to people, first of all, you see man's problem is not as it is here. The number one problem is not sin, guilt, and God's wrath. As I have been teaching in soteriology of this series, man's number one problem is broken relationship. Therefore, the church helps them solve that problem, reconciliation. Number two, man's problem is death. And when we say death, we're saying all the consequences of sin. Self-pity, shame, guilt, sickness, poverty, broken relationships, everything that has come to the world because of death, that's man's problem too. And then the problem of the world. We live in a dark world. Um, therefore, the church is to be helping people know the truth to get them out. The answer to a broken relationship, they need to be teaching about this new covenant God has made. Yes, it happened at the cross. The new covenant is made. Now God will forgive your sins and you will become his people. You will become his children. So it's a slightly different emphasis on the answer. Second problem, death. Well, what should be coming from the pulpit is life. Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It's the answers God gives for this death. You shouldn't be living in shame or guilt. You shouldn't have to go through your days, you know, in stinking thinking. You should be thinking on the righteousness that's been given to you by Jesus Christ. And then the world, the answer to the darkness of the world, is the kingdom of God. We've been transported into a new kingdom where Jesus reigns. So a person leaving a church with father-son theology... The, the manner in which they'd leave, they, what they're conscious of, they wouldn't be conscious of their sins and then how Jesus died. They might be more conscious of the goodness of God. I'm related to him. He has made it possible. And now God is with me. And I'm going to go out the doors of the church ready to establish the kingdom of God on earth. It's a much more victorious, on top. People leave sensing that victory and sensing God is with them to help them in their daily lives. There is a different tone depending on your theology and the church, very, every meeting will be influenced by that theology because a leader, it feels responsible to teach the truth. And if they can perceive the truth down here is above all else, sin, guilt, and God's wrath, they want to present that and the answer of the cross. Up here, 
We want to present, and above all, Jesus is Lord. Ending with that. Um, and of course, yes, the answer is God's wrath, but God's wrath, as I explained in soteriology, is something stored up for the future, for the judgment day. That's not the focus. That's not the number one thing in Father Son theology, yet it is an aspect of salvation. Okay, now let's talk about the sacraments. What did the church do in sacraments? Um, Roman Catholicism through the years has developed seven sacraments. Um, most Protestants do not accept all seven. Most Protestants accept the two that are clearly identified as coming from Jesus, water baptism and communion. Most Protestants, water baptism, they'll see in Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then Jesus, on the Last Supper, before he dies, he takes bread, he gives it to them, he takes the wine, and he says, uh, do this in remembrance of me. So most Protestants look to those two, and they continue to practice them today. Roman Catholics take those two plus some others that they've developed um, and call them sacraments. Now, there's one more difference, though, is Catholics call them sacraments. Many Protestants don't call them sacraments. They call them ordinances. Ordinance is a practice. It's a ritual. It is something you carry out again and again. An ordinance. This is our practice. Or a sacrament implies in the word that it is an avenue through which grace is coming to the individual. So when you take communion, the sacrament of communion in the Catholic Church, there's grace coming from God to that person. Um, baptism, water baptism, in Catholic Church you see grace coming to the person being baptized. God is literally using the church's sacraments as channels through which his grace comes. Now many Protestants reject that. Remember back here, we have talked much about the concept of Reformed theology built on the foundation of ancient Greek thought, dualism, built on the concept God radiates out of attributes, God is in exhaustive control. When God is that, we define grace down here. And grace is unmerited favor. Okay? That definition of grace implies that God does it all, and humans have no part, unmerited. In strict reform theology, only God can give grace. Man has no role to play. God and God alone gives it. Okay? That excludes grace coming through the sacraments. You see, um, those who were true to this understanding of grace, which is the logical uh, outcome of a concept of God where he's timeless, immutable, and passable, and omnipotent. This is the logical definition of grace. This logical definition of grace implies that man can play no role. He is totally helpless. Only God can do it. Therefore, man cannot offer sacrament and allow grace to flow. So many denominations call them ordinances because ordinance has no implication of grace flowing. It's just how we act, how we do it. Okay. Now, I have embraced Father-Son theology. I have taught grace in a different way. I, in another session, because of the concept of God that we have developed, um, and I, I don't want to repeat all of this earlier discussion, just refer to it again. So please understand there is deeper teaching on this subject in other sessions. But grace is the empowering presence of God, enabling you to be who you're called to be. And this grace is available, and God literally wants his children to be ministers of this grace, that we do have authority. God has granted to us the authority to release grace. Of course, God can do it without us. He can sovereignly, on his own, deposit grace in people. But I was teaching that, no, God can give grace in many different ways. He can do it without us. He can give grace in total authority where it actually compels a person to do what he wants. He can give grace that is resistible, but it helps a person. God can give grace in any amount. They can resist it at times. Um, you know, where Paul says, don't receive the grace in vain. Um, work according to the grace given to you. Um, so grace is literally the empowering presence of God, enabling you to be what you're called to be, that literally God's children have been given authority, and this includes the church and God's people, to be channels of grace. Okay. Now, 
it's more of the charismatic Pentecostal churches that fully embrace that. You would see when someone lays hands for healing, there's a belief implied there that God will use this person if they pray and the grace of healing will flow through them to heal. The laying on of hands to impart an anointing for ministry, to impart um, all kinds of a prayer. The very act of prayer is asking God to release His grace, being a vessel through which grace. But down here, true to the entire system of thought, even prayer of an individual does not release grace unless God predestined that person to pray that prayer. No human being can play a part in it. That's profoundly changing the entire image of the church. See, before the Protestant Reformation, it was commonly believed among people that when you get a sacrament, you, or when you just go to church, you're receiving grace. You're receiving favor in God's eyes, and therefore you'll benefit both in this life and the next life. People went to church to get something, to get a benefit, a supernatural spirit deposit within them. But now we have people like Mar uh, John Calvin clarifying, thinking the logical implications of this concept of God. Okay? He's, he still has the same concept of God that was built in classical theology, but he is being consistent with it. He is saying, you guys say this about God, therefore you have to believe this. John Calvin was strict and consistent in his theology, coming to the conclusion, no human being can play any role in grace, therefore the view of the church, what the church looks like, changes less and less since the Protestant Reformation, have people thought of the church as a place where we can actually get something, we can benefit, that the church plays a role in administering something out of grace. Different streams, different denominations have different awarenesses of it. Of course, Pentecostal Charismatics, they're on the edge of saying, no, we play a huge role in administering God's grace, where those who are true to Reformed theology no, you're not getting something from God by going to church. You're not getting something by letting something pray over. There is no transmission because of a human's action. Okay, Now, that varies the effectiveness of the church today. If the world out there looks at the church and comes to the conclusion the church can't give me anything, why go there? And it's a huge issue in Christianity, and it's in the back of the minds of many people, but they're making decisions based on these back-of-the-mind thoughts. Um, I believe that a huge disservice was done when in the Protestant Reformation so many of our leaders concluded and taught that no human being can play a role in imparting grace. I believe that they neutered, they rendered impotent much of Christianity at that point. And we have to get back to uh, the true definition of grace, which implies changing our concept of God, changing everything else we're talking about in Father Son Theology. Okay, uh, probably talked enough about that, but it's a serious issue. Preaching the Word, church does that. Um, again, that is also reflected. Does grace come with the Word? People like me say, yes, yes, it does. Uh, Paul instructed Timothy, pay attention to the public reading of Scripture um, and to preaching and teaching. There's something we can build on, but it was also the practice among the Jewish people. It was a practice carried from the Jewish nation into Christianity. It, it was, it's in God's heart that his words be spoken out. Okay? And how we value those words is dependent on how we're taught, too. Some churches don't value the word as highly as others. Um, and it's not just the word, but it's preaching about the word. It's explaining it to the people. Of course, there's many activity in churches today where um, someone might take a scripture, but they're not teaching. They're teaching their own message. You know, we don't want to give the stamp of approval and say all preaching is actually fulfilling what God wants us to do. Um, some do it, you know, out of their charisma. They're doing it just to attract people. Okay, aside from that, the church does have a responsibility to share the word to preach and expound upon the Word. That's part of this community. Um, we are a temple Holy Spirit. Finally, what makes the church different than all other organizations? Well, it was established by God. This is Jesus Christ is the head of it. Okay, no other institution can claim it of the same authority. Uh, and we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. No other organization can 
claim that kind of authority. Uh, they might, a Christian organization may say, well, God is helping us, God is in us, but the concept of the church is a beautiful bride. It, it is, Jesus has died for it. He didn't die for this side organization where someone else is accomplishing something good and he is helping them. No, he died for a people. This is the entity. It is in human nature to need what God is providing. We need to have freedom from guilt and shame. We need to have a relationship with God. We also need community. We are created by God with a need for community. God, in His wisdom, satisfied our needs. He is meeting our needs. And when we flow with His plans, as a consequence, our needs get met. We become healthier people. You can't be a healthy person thinking it's just you and God. But even the concept of salvation in the biblical sense was not just salvation you individually, but you're saved out of the world into a community. You're saved also into the kingdom of God. You're saved into something. You're brought from one place and put into another place. And many people have not understood that. Many Christians don't realize that their salvation was into a community, and so they isolate themselves and they can rationalize it. Again, a misunderstanding of what the community is. They can rationalize their misbehavior, their acting wrong by staying away from the community. Finally, the destiny of the church. Um, well, I, I don't believe that destiny is actually uh, profoundly influenced by, by way back here, platonic thought, okay? The destiny, anybody on either side, either theology could come uh, and read the words of Jesus where he prays for the church that they may be one. Um, to me, that is a scripture that must be fulfilled. I'm still looking for the church to come into greater and greater unity. Uh, Ephesians 2.20, where it talks about, and we are a people being fitly framed together to become a dwelling place from God, that more and more, as the time goes on, the closer we turn, that we, we approach the return of Jesus, the church is going to have more and more of the manifest presence of God, more healings, more more power, more of His presence. The um, kingdom of God will keep on growing as the church keeps on growing. That Jesus had expressed great faith in the church when He said they will do the very works that I do and greater works. That we, in seeing the church as God's community, should have great optimism. We should say no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what kind of attacks come against Christianity, God is allowed, give authority to His Son to build the church and the church will succeed, the gates of Hades will not prevail, and the church will mature, it will go. Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12, he talks about the church has been given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Scriptures like that imply to me that Jesus has an end goal in mind, that he is moving the church in this direction of maturity and unity. Therefore, we should be expecting every year the church to get better, more and more like Jesus, more and more loving, more and more unified. So, that's where I'm closing this part. Um, we've been talking about ecclesiology, the study of the church, um, volume 7 in the book Father, Son, Theology, but there we also talk about basiology, the study of the kingdom, and that will be our next session. Okay, so God bless you. Thanks for watching. I hope you get time to study this even more. Thank <laughs> you.